let's say you have a 30 year old patient who came in because he got into a car accident. Okay. He comes to the hospital with his wife, right? But unfortunately the patient succumbs to his injuries. Okay. So he passes away. The wife is devastated by this news. She tells the team that, look, we've been trying to conceive for over a year now. And uh, what I want you guys to do is to retrieve his sperm so that I can conceive his child. So the question is, what should the doctors do? Should the doctors fulfill this request? For the purposes of the discussion, let's assume a couple of things, right? So one, let's assume that the wife is correct, that they were trying to conceive for the past like year or so, okay? Let's say that there are records that they went to go see a fertility doctor or something like that. But two, let's assume that there was no prior discussion over whether or not the husband will want to have a child if the husband were not alive, okay? Which I think it's a fair assumption. Most people probably don't talk about that. The first thing that comes to mind is the question of autonomy, okay? So autonomy means self-rule, right? That's, that's what it means. So when we want to respect somebody's autonomy, it means that we want to respect their decisions, okay? We want people to rule themselves. So in this case, the question is whether or not the husband would have wanted his wife to conceive a child without him. So if there's no proof or no evidence that the husband wanted that, I would actually say that we should not extract his sperm. The fact that he wanted to conceive a child with her, I think is a separate decision, right? One thing is to have a child with your partner. The other is wanting your partner to have a child without you. So just because you consent to one does not mean that you consent to the other. Robert Orr published a paper in which he argued something very similar, but he also said that you should take the welfare of the child into consideration or the welfare of the future child into consideration. And so basically the hospital should think about whether or not the future child is going to have a good life being raised by, you know, a single mother or, so, or something like that. And I generally am opposed to this, okay, for a couple of reasons. One is because it requires us to make judgments on how good that mom, that single mother can be, right? And how good of a life she can give her child. And I think those type of judgments are just very susceptible to bias and prejudice, you know, so I'm generally worried about that. Another reason is because I'm not even sure if there's enough time to do it. I think you have to retrieve the sperm within like 24 hours. So there's a time constraint. The last reason is more philosophical. So this judgment seems to require us to say that being alive in a circumstance in which you're raised by a single mother and, you know, maybe the single mother is like poor or something like that, okay, is worse than non-existence, right, is worse than not having been born at all. And that seems like a weird judgment call to make. I generally think that you require two states of well-being in order to make a kind of better off or worse off judgment, right? So think about this. If I say that something is good for me, that means it increases my well-being. So if I say vitamins are good for me, right, that means, you know, my state of well-being is maybe at like a five. And, you know, if I take vitamins, eventually my well-being is going to be at like a six. OK, likewise, if I say that something is bad for me or if something harms me, right, that means it's going to lower my well-being, right? So maybe I'm at a five and then something bad happens to me. And so now I'm at a four. So this requires two states of well-being and you have to compare them, right? Yeah, there's like an original state of well-being and then there's like the new state of well-being. If you don't exist, then you're not a subject of well-being. So you don't have this prior original state of well-being to compare the new state of well-being to. So that's why I'm generally resistant to that type of judgment. So for those three reasons, I would not consider the future child's well-being. Just so that you have more information, this is Cornell's policy on this issue. At the heart of this issue is ensuring that the lost loved one genuinely intended to procreate or was already trying to conceive with his wife. Consideration of whether the decedent would have wanted conception to occur post-mortem with his wife should also be evaluated. This can be determined through their actions or discussions prior to death with respect to conception or pregnancy. Their stated, written, or acted on wishes prior to death should weigh significantly in any decision-making regarding PMSR. So that stands for post-mortem sperm retrieval. So in general, I would agree with this policy, although I would emphasize that we need evidence that the husband would have wanted the wife to conceive his child without him, okay? That he would want his wife to conceive his child even if he were dead. All right, I'm going to end it here. I hope you found it interesting, and I'll see you all next time.